of exaggeration somehow. Um, uh, I'm very glad to be here uh, to talk about sound environment in hospitals. Uh, am I speaking too loud or too... No? Is it okay? Good. Okay. Uh, so my, my, fo my research focus has over the years been trying to relate uh, uh, human response to sound characteristics uh, always with the aim of um, preventing adverse reactions to, to sound or noise. So I don't have uh, much experience in the music field that you heard b uh, before. So I hope that uh, this will be uh, quite a nice compliment to the previous presentations. Uh, and I think that we can all agree that hospitals should be conducive to patient recovery and safety, as well as employee health and productivity. And of course over the years there's been great improvement in uh, development of, of medical equipment, medication and also care. But what about noise? And this is something that Pear already showed you, which I still think is a fantastic thing that it would happen 150 years ago. But we don't seem to have listened, um, because in this uh, uh, picture here is shown a meta-analysis done by Bushnik and Vishniak uh, co-workers in 2005, where they have tried to analyse the uh, development of sound levels in hospitals during day and night time. And this is 1960 and 2005. And it seems to be an increase in sound levels, both during day and night time over these years. And it amounts to about um, 8 dB over a 20-year period. And 8 dB, what is that? Well, it's close to a doubling of perceived loudness. So it is much more than you think, or it is that much. Uh, of course, we have to acknowledge that the hospitals have unique requirements with great demands on hygiene, safety, mobility. And uh, these days, it is very high technology density in the intensive care unit. And most surfaces are acoustically hard. And this together uh, forms this very complex sound environment. And patients are particularly susceptible for environmental factors, inclusive noise. At the same time, there's a high personal strain. It's very often a life and death situation where they have to make decisions even though they're exposed to these sounds. And as Pear said, many of these alarms are unnecessary. And as you understand from this and the previous, the importance of a healthy soundscape uh, in hospitals have so far not been acknowledged. Many papers have uh, tried to rate the most disturbing sources in hospitals. And this is a, a summary I tried to make. And you can see that most disturbing sources are mainly made up of conversations, probably not so much directed to the patient, but conversations between personnel, and uh, alarms and medical equipment, but also activity noise from corridor, telephone ringing, and the obstetric uh, care is the mother's screaming, door slamming, overhead paging, or other sources of disturbing noises. And if we measure on a, this is a neurointensive care unit in Gothenburg, Sahlgrenska Hospital. If we measure during the night, this is uh, what the very typical night looks like. This is measured close to the patient. And uh, the blue line here is the equivalent level, uh, 30 second averaged over the night. These are the maximum level, the red one, and these are peak levels. According to the VHO guidelines, the maximum level should not be more than 40. We can't find any of those kind of low levels in the hospital settings. It's just not there. And if you see the time periods where there's any type of restoration, 
Well, maybe sometime here between one o'clock and ten minutes past one or something like that. It is a very, very active environment that these patients are exposed to. So we try to calculate the restorative periods for these patients. Uh, and we had to calculate restorative pay periods being more than, than what is uh, stated by the WHO guidelines. So somewhere around maximum level of 52, 53 dBA. And during daytime, the mean lengths of these periods were 9 minutes. And the maximum lengths were 90 minutes. And during nighttime, the mean length was 30 minutes and maximum was 15 minutes. So you can sort of understand that it's not easy to restore in this type of environment. Because as Per already said that even if you are sedated, there is, your hearing is usually alert. In the um, uh, summary of articles <coughs> looking at patient reactions, most studies have looked at sleep disturbance. There are 18 articles that I found. Cardiovascular response is also quite well covered, while the other effects are much more poorly covered. Uh, so I will focus on sleep in the intensive care unit and talk a little bit more so about intensive care delirium. As you may uh, not be uh, surprised by, the uh, sleep quality in the intensive care is rated as less compared to the home environment. That is not surprising. What may be more surprising is that insomnia is ranked among patients as the second most important stressor after pain. And that patients that were interviewed, about 61% of those reported sleep deprivation as their worst experience uh, being at the intensive care unit. And it also takes a long time for this uh, disturbed sleep pattern that occur at the intensive care unit to normalize. Up to nine days it may take. And also one thing that we tend to forget is that a lot of the sleep in the intensive care unit, it occurs during day. So also the daytime activities are of importance. So how much of then of sleep disturbance can be attributed to noise, since sleep disturbance, of course, in the intensive care unit is uh, affected by so many other factors like the medication, the care activities, pain, ventilators and so on. In the studies where one had tried to um, uh, assess how much noise uh, can uh, um, be responsible for the arousals and awakenings, one has seen that in this first study, 11% of the arousals and 17% of the awakenings were caused by noise. So in total, about 28% of the arousals. And in the other study, it amounts to about 41%. So that's quite a, a high percentage. And what's mo more important, I think, is that these arousals can be prevented. That is the actually most important thing. Many of the other factors disturbing sleep in the intensive care unit, we cannot do that much more about, but the noise could be done quite a lot about to, re to reduce, I think. I'll just go through you a very interesting study that was carried out uh, a year ago, uh, where they tried to evaluate the arousal probability of various types of cells that can be found in the intensive care unit. And they exposed healthy subjects, 12 healthy subjects for uh, um, noises starting at 40 dBA and going up to 70 dBA once they were asleep. So they were online monitoring their sleep and when they entered the sleep stage for 90 seconds they started exposing them for sound. 40, 45, 50, and so on, until there was an arousal measured with EEG and EMG. So then they uh, ceased the noise, and then the subject went back to sleep again, and then they started again. So they continued like that during the night. I'm glad I wasn't a test subject. Mm -hmm. uh, 
And the results vary, of course, a bit on what type of sleep stage the subject were in. But for simplicity, I'm showing here the N3 sleep, the deep sleep, which is meant to be of highest importance for recovery. And this is uh, the average of uh, uh, arousal probability for level during this deep sleep stage. But if we look at these uh, various types of sounds and the arousal probability, we can see that phone ringing and door slamming, it has a very high probability of causing arousal already at 40-45 dBA. And then there's a, uh, all these other sounds are here like towel dispenser, voice and so on. While the transportation noise seems to have a lower arousal probability. So you can see here that in order to achieve a good sound environment we need to aim for very low levels if, if we're going to do this. If we're going to reduce, it's really we have to reduce the levels quite a lot. Uh, we tried to get a more, to take a more holistic perspective on this, so we took recordings from the intensive care unit and we took it to our lab, where we again uh, used healthy uh, subjects, uh, 18 subjects that were sleeping in our lab with, uh, with the polysomnogram recording all fitted to an electrodes. Uh, recording the brain waves, the pulse, the muscular activity, heart rate and so on. This is what we used for exposure. Not correct level probably now, but... the door. Someone dropping something. Scissors. Yeah, uh, so we exposed them for uh, the, one could say, the original no noise with an equivalent level of 47 dBA, 64 dBA maximum levels, these alarms and the doors uh, slamming. We also did a, um, expose them to a peak reduced noise. So we tried, we thought, okay, what about we try to do an intervention of the sound in our experiment. So we took away the worst alarms and we took away the door slamming. Uh, so we reduced the maximum level with about 10 dB, which again is a lot. Uh, but in reality, the sounds that we had recorded had an, a maximum level of 85 dBA. But in the pilot study, we realized we could not expose subjects for these type of sounds. They would not have stayed in the lab. And I should say that also in the reduced uh, exposure sounds, we had two test subjects that actually pressed the, the alarm button saying, I'm not going to take part in this anymore in the middle of the night. And that has never happened to me any time before or after that. So they, they, they thought this was enough. So what were the results? Uh, well, we can see that this is the control night, the slow wave uh, sleep, the deep sleep, about 70 minutes, which is quite normal. In these exposure sounds, it was reduced with about 20 minutes. And that's a lot. It's a lot. Uh, but there was no difference either for slow wave sleep or awakenings of the peak reduced sounds. So 
really, I mean, there were some minor, we can see some minor effects, but the, the large effects, were n we didn't see anything by, by reducing the sound the way we did. And the same with the sleep quality index. Uh, again, uh, it's more, more, we can say it's more bad, sleep is more bad in this kind of uh, in the exposure, so significantly so. So what this tells us, and I guess it's, a much, it's very much in agreement with the previous studies, is that sleep is disturbed at very low levels for these types of sounds. One of the uh, more serious effects of being uh, cared for in the intensive care unit is the development of intensive care uh, unit syndrome. It may have several causes and it is also affected to, uh, or it's associated to various variables uh, in the personal variables. But one thinks that noise may contribute to the development of these symptoms. Uh, as you see here, it, it is a, a um, syndrome that is uh, causes distress, bewilderment, hallucinations, um, fear. And this is a picture that one of the patients has drawn from, of their nightmares. And these nightmares may continue a long time after they have been uh, cared at the intensive care unit. Uh, the incidence uh, of these uh, syndromes is about 30% and uh, mild confusion is around 25%. And What's more important is that it's associated with longer stay in hospital, higher morbidity and also higher mortality. So it's a serious uh, outcome. In a very interesting study that was done now in 2012, one tried to uh, in intervene uh, in the physical unit by uh, offering earplugs. Uh, and uh, in this randomized control study, 69 patients got earplugs and 67 control patients without earplugs. And they found that the use of earplugs lowered the incidence of intensive care unit syndrome uh, with a reduction of 53% the risk of development, both the mild confusion and the uh, in intensive care unit syndrome. So that was a, that was a large reduction. Uh, but whether it's the right way to go, I think we have to discuss that much further because, of course, wearing earplugs, you will be, uh, you can't be talked to, communicated to, and you probably feel very enclosed. And as Per said, many patients don't really want to be this kind of enclosed. But it shows this study that then if you have an undisturbed recovery period, you can probably lower the risk of developing intensive care unit syndrome. And that's the most important. So if we summarize the patient outcome, we can say that there are very few studies that have been, carried, been able to carry out good, uh, well, good research, good evidence-based studies, mainly because it is very difficult to intervene when we have these very sick patients very difficult to record uh, sleep for very sick patients and so on. But we need to find ways to know more about a noise effect, sleep, use of medication, rehospitalization, and the development of the intensive care unit syndrome. That's for sure. I will say something also about what was known about the personnel uh, very briefly. And uh, third, Surreal has already shown talk to you about this very interesting study that was done in Huddinge, so I will skip that. Uh, what we can state is that hospitals are inherently stressful places. And uh, the study shows that, that there is a high level of dissatisfaction, distress and burnout at work among healthcare workers. And as for other workplaces, these factors that are found to be of importance for psychological health, like work demand, lack of control, poor support from manager, they exist in hospitals. But they exist, these associations that are true in hospitals, they're also true in other workplaces. And as far as I know, there's just one study that has shown that the hospital personnel are more uh, 
sick than other personnel being exposed to these poor demand and so on. So it's um, uh, it, it, there seems to be other factors supporting the personnel working here. And also when it comes to the effects of physiological effect like uh, acoustics or sound environment, there are very few studies being carried out. The outcomes of concern are speech interference, hearing what is being said correctly, mental fatigue, making errors, uh, annoyance, psychosocial well-being. We have over the years uh, tried to study the uh, hospital soundscape um, in various ways. We started with the neurointensive care unit 2006, that was a cross-sectional study. And then we went on to medical surgical intensive care unit, looking at acoustics personnel and also patient response. Also cross-sectional study. Uh, there's an ongoing intervention study that I will talk a little bit about, where we also look at pers uh, acoustics, personal response, and maybe we can look at patient response. Don't know yet. And then we have a fourth study where we look at the, the um, um, uh, personnel in obstetric uh, care and uh, mainly looking at the risk for hearing uh, related disorders among those personnel. Uh, when we asked the personnel at the, at the intensive care unit and the neurointensive care unit, they show quite good agreement in their relation to alarm. They say that more than 50% have some time adjusted alarm levels so they can't hear it. They also say mo nearly 60% or more than 60 say that audio alarms can be replaced with visual alarms, for example. Or maybe we could have a combination of visual and, and vibrating alarms. I have never understood why we have to hear the alarms in the patient's room. Why does it have to be there? Why does it have to be all over the corridors at this in some of the units? If we look at noise annoyance in relation to other work groups, these bars show the percentage of, of staff annoyed, and this is the sound level. This is primary health care offices, and they are clearly less annoyed than the intensive care unit and obstetric personnel. That again is not as annoyed as the preschool. Preschool is more noisy than the intensive care unit, if we look at the personnel side. But still, high prevalence of annoyance. Then I will, uh, uh, finally, finally, I will mention a little bit about this intervention study that is being done in Borås. It's under the leadership of Birk Lindahl and Ingjerd Bergbom in the uh, health and caring sciences. And the intervention uh, includes not just uh, the sound environment, but the, uh, the colors, uh, the, that one has tried to take away as many cables as possible in the intervention room. Uh, one has introduced a diurnal light, so there'll be a daytime and nighttime. Uh, and one has put up absorbance in the ceiling uh, class A in the intervention room. Uh, some room acoustic measures that were done by Katrin Bergman uh, in Ecofon uh, before the study started showed that the uh, absorbance had an effect mainly in this low frequency uh, part, which I think was also expected. Uh, that can be seen here in the reverberation time being shorter in the intervention room, but also that the speech clarity is uh, higher also again in the lower frequency room. Speech clarity is a uh, unit uh, measuring the relationship between the direct reflexes and the, well, the, the early reflexes and the late reflexes in speech. So if you have a, a high um, amount of uh, early reflexes, then you can hear speech easier and you're not interfered by the late reflexes in the room. 
Some preliminary data from this, from the personnel, showed that the overall impression was slightly better in the intervention room. The ergonomic was definitely not. It's significantly worse in the, in the intervention room. Also, workspace was significantly worse. So there's less space, there's less space to move around in this intervention room. And also the ergonomic was not really part of the intervention, unfortunately. But aesthetically and light and sound environment is clearly significantly perceived better. If we then look at the data that we obtained in 2010 before this intervention room was, was planned or built, and when we ask the same questions for the intervention room when it was built in 2013, we can see that the intervention room is perceived as more quiet, less noisy, less beeping and less hissing. Uh, and I think this is, is quite good since this, this data has been collected at, at, at various time intervals and uh, um, so it gives a better validity of the data. So I think it quite clearly shows that uh, the personnel perceive this room, the sound environment in the room as uh, superior. But as all these studies, it would have been fantastic if we could, do, uh, could have done a, a blind study, of course. Then we would have taken away the errors that could be introduced, but knowing that we have done an intervention. Uh, what I should say also in this study is what we hope to do uh, to learn more is to try and uh, do psychoacoustic evaluations of the sounds in the intervention room and in the control room, trying to, to assess whether uh, the quality of the sound is different in the intervention room as compared to the control room. Because entering the intervention room, you sort of get the feeling that you enter a, a more uh, comfortable, more pleasant setting. And it could be the case that you also then lower your voice, maybe you move around in a different way and so on. That would be very interesting to find out. So my concluding thoughts are that we need, we need uh, more studies, we need better studies, and we need studies where uh, pr professions from the hospital and the research are doing studying to studies together, combined studies. And also combined studies between uh, human response side and acousticians, because there's too many studies being done with either by acousticians or by health personnel. They don't seem to have talked. Uh, we need more intervention studies uh, in order to assess this. Uh, we need better quality of the noise assessments. Definitely. And in order to achieve this caring hospital sound environment, I think we need to strive for support environment. Support environment both when it comes to listening, communication and also attending to the alarms. We need to think more in a holistic way there. We definitely need to avoid unnecessary, meaningless sounds. I think that's, that's must be time to start doing that now. And maybe we could also strive for pleasant sound environment. Maybe we could increase the belonging and the security, both for the patient and the next of kind, sitting there um, being worried for their family member and so on. Thank you very much for listening. And I should uh, thank also my collaborators and the funders for these studies. Thank you.